Hello and welcome to St. Matthew Lutheran Church of Milwaukee. This is the service for June 20th, 2021, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We begin with the opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy, Holy and, and merciful, merciful Father, Father I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner. a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Almighty God, merciful Father, you crown our life with your love. You take away our sin, you comfort our spirit, you make us pure and holy in your sight. gave him up for us all. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. O Son of God, eternal word of the Father, you came to live with us. You made your Father known. You washed us from our sins in your own blood. You are the King of glory. You are the Lord. O oh Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Let us pray. O God, protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture reading is from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 17, beginning at verse 22. These verses are the text for our sermon, which has the theme, Behold the greater gathering of nations. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I myself will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it. I will break off a tender sprig from its topmost shoots and plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I will plant it. It will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. 
I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 92, which we sing responsively. This man does not know. Fools do not understand that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evil doers flourish, they will be forever dehes. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. Lord, let your mercy be on us as we place our trust in you. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the The second reading is from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, the first 10 verses. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. 
for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is the word of God. Alleluia. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. May your saints sing for joy. Alleluia. The Gospel is recorded by St. Mark in chapter 4, beginning at verse 26. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the Gospel. Praise be to you, Christ. We continue with hymn 188. Help us eat 
eternal truths receive and practice all that we believe. Give us your wisdom that we see the glory of the Trinity. Immortal honor, endless fame, attend the Almighty Father's name. The Savior, Son, be glorified, who for all humankind has died. And equal adoration rise to you, O Spirit, in the skies. Grace and peace are yours in Christ Jesus, the Lord and Savior of the nations. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed in Jesus Christ, this past week many of the eyes of the world turned to southern England, and that wasn't because of the relatively recent birth of another royal baby. No, the occasion was the meeting of the G7. G is for group, the group of seven of the richest nations in the world. For almost 50 years, a group like this has gathered. The leaders of those nations have gathered. And they have discussed the present realities of the world and looked a little bit to the future of the world as well. But the words of Ezekiel the prophet point us to a different gathering of the nations. A greater group, a greater gathering, not concerned just with the present and future of the world, but a gathering that involves the past and the present and the future and the eternity of all people. So today we say, behold the greater gathering of nations where treaties are worthless, where the possibilities are endless. The G7 sometimes works out treaties among its members. For example, this year they put together some kind of agreement about the level of corporate taxes in their nations. Will this treaty be a good thing? A number of people think so. Will this treaty endure? Probably for a time, but certainly not forever. But it seems they might do some good for some time, so we wouldn't rush to say that these, this treaty is worthless. But 2,500 years ago, God was saying that some treaties were worthless. The Lord Almighty was angry about some treaties. They were not good. They certainly did not endure, and they were, were really worse than worthless. Worse than worthless because they specifically rebelled against and angered the Lord their God. God had warned the Israelites when he at last brought them into the promised land of Canaan, they were not to make alliances with any other nation. But now that Babylon had come in and conquered them, the king of Judah signed on the dotted line to agree to work with Babylonia, to fight with them, to be of assistant, mil assistance militarily. King Zedekiah agreed to this treaty. So that was wrong. But Zedekiah went from bad to worse. He then made a secret treaty with Egypt to fight with Egypt against Babylonia, the one he had agreed to work with. What made it really bad was that the first oath 
promise, treaty that he had made with Babylon, he had made in the Lord's name. And this angered God, and this made this treaty with Egypt much worse than worthless. It only angered God and led him to declare this about what was going to happen to King Zedekiah's hope that if Judah and Egypt fight together against Babylon, they could overthrow them. This is what God said in this chapter. Pharaoh with his mighty army and great horde will be of no help to him in war. When ramps are built and siege works erected to destroy many lives. And then more words of anger and judgment against Zedekiah. I will bring him to Babylon and execute judgment on him there because he was unfaithful to me. So those treaties angered and insulted God and it would be nice if that was the end of such treaties that anger and insult God, but we know it's not. God is just as anger, just as insulted when people try to come up with treaties that make peace between sinners and a holy God. No, no one writes up a formal treaty and takes it to God for a signature, but in a way, people do present God with a treaty, with terms. Zedekiah insulted God by using his name to make that devious promise with Egypt to make the kind of treaty that God had said specifically not to make. It was an insult to God because Zedekiah was in effect saying, I do not have confidence in the Almighty God, our gracious, faithful God. I don't have confidence that he can see us through our difficulties. I don't have confidence that he can be the one who wins victory over our enemies. Lord, you are not enough for us. We need to look to others. And that's the kind of treaty that people are really making all the time with God. He identifies himself as the gracious God, eager to forgive us freely and fully. And people come to him and say, I I'm not confident that you're going to do that. I, I have a different plan. In that one treaty, Zedekiah was saying that the strength of Judah and the strength of Egypt, get those together and they will overcome Babylon. When God had said, remain faithful to me and no nation is a match for Israel alone. That's the kind of insulting treaty people make when they say to God, we want to take your grace and love and add our works to it, add our goodness to it. And that will help defeat our enemies of sin, of the devil, of death. But as, as has been well said, God's grace plus our works equals nothing equals no salvation. The victory is the Lord's and the Lord's alone. It's not up to us to propose variations on what God presents to us as a gift. And we have to be reminded again and again that anything which directs our attention, our confidence, our, our trust inward to ourselves is trouble for us. Serious spiritual trouble when we look inside us for confidence of rescue from our sins. The last words we heard Ezekiel record from the Lord are this, I the Lord have spoken and I will do it. Those words were not I the Lord have spoken and I will be able to do it if I get a little help from you. No, he said I have spoken it I will do it. We want no part of a treaty which negotiates with God for some kind of terms of salvation. We want his covenant of grace presenting to us the full package of forgiveness and peace and eternal life all as a gift. 
We are here to be part, to be branches in his, the great tree of his church. And this prophecy of Ezekiel says we are here to produce fruit, not to negotiate terms, not to work on worthless treaties. You know, Zedekiah's story gives us the continuing, seemingly almost constant theme of God's Old Testament people rebelling against him, despising his word, rejecting his promises, wanting to be like the other nations. Can we have what the other people have? Can we live and behave like the other nations do? Why can't we have the other things that the other people do? But the near continuous darkness of Israel and Judah's behavior and rebellion does serve this purpose. It makes the brightness of God's grace and love shine all the more brightly. It allows the power of God to shine through. With God, nothing is impossible. Not the birth of a son, Isaac, to the elderly Abraham and the barren Sarah, not the rescue of a nation in chains to Egypt, out of Egypt. Not the birth of the Savior to a virgin, the Virgin Mary. All of those events were the planting and growth and fulfillment of all that God had promised. In the Gospel reading today, Jesus echoes this picture of a great tree growing from a little cutting. Through Ezekiel, God spoke of taking this little sprig off the top of a cedar, going up on a mountain and planting it, and it becoming a mighty tree. Jesus spoke of the tiny mustard seed planted in a garden, and yet it grows to be the biggest thing in the garden, big enough to have branches that birds nest in. Ezekiel's prophecy of the New Testament church speaks of birds of every kind resting in this tree, taking shelter in this tree. This tree is the holy Christian church. Human imagination at the time of Ezekiel would have said that is not possible, that is not imaginable. Human doubt at the time of Jesus said things like this, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Human logic continues to say God's gift of full and free forgiveness is not logical. But God's power and grace are limitless and it overcomes our doubts and it crushes our logic. Who would have ever thought that after Judah and the city of Jerusalem, and the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, who would have ever thought that the God of that nation could still keep his promises to them? But he did. And from that conquered nation that reduced and shamed itself so badly, that shamed itself into making secret deals with Egypt of all places, from that nation would come a power, would come a ruler mightier and greater than any power and any rule the world had ever known. From this defeated nation, which was even in rougher and more disintegrated shape when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, from this nation would come the mighty tree of the church, because one of the descendants of Abraham, one of the descendants of the once mighty King David, would be savior and ruler over all. Through a later prophet, the prophet Zechariah, the Lord said this, I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. All sin removed in a single day, yes, all sin all sin on the tree of the cross. Because the tree of the cross was big enough for the sins of the whole world, the tree of the New Testament church is big enough for all the nations and peoples of the world. 
From that instrument of death, the tree of the cross, grows the tree of life that is his church. Big enough for all kinds of birds. There's all kinds of these personality tests that go around where they say, what type of person are you? One of them involves doves, and they ask, are you? One of those involves birds. And they lead us to conclude, well, maybe I'm one, my type of bird is a peaceful dove, or maybe I'm a cranky crow, or maybe I'm a soaring eagle. Maybe we're odd ducks. It doesn't matter. In this tree, God is calling for all to take shelter there. The God of limitless power claims us shapes us, cleanses us, and makes us his own. And certainly more than personality types, this description of birds of all kinds coming to this tree is a reminder that Jesus is the Savior of all nations. What were the odds that all the nations of the world would look to this one little broken nation for salvation? Israel did not have great riches. It did not have great natural resources. It certainly at the time of the Savior did not have any military to speak of. It would seem absurd that this nation would be the one to whom all other nations looked. But God gathered the nations. His grace, his power is limitless. He can make the low tree tall and the tall tree low. He can dry up the green tree and make the dry one flourish. The experts, as they look at something like the G7 conference, even, even those who are kind of optimistic about what people can do, they caution, don't really get your hopes up. This group of world leaders is not likely to accomplish anything of, of great consequence. But as we turn our eyes to this greater conference of nations in this tree that is the church, God says, by all means, get your hopes up. He will keep every promise to you. He will deliver us. His grace has already gathered us into this tree. And his grace will one day take us to the tree of life in heaven. Amen. We join in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe, we believe in, in one God, the, the Father, Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our prayer today, we include thoughts on Father's Day. Let us pray. 
Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand. The beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. Gracious Lord, we come before you with the request for the fathers of the world and of our nation. We pray, first of all, that you give them a spirit that is desiring to be good fathers, staying with their children, providing for their daily physical needs. Above all, we pray that ever more fathers will be ever more involved spiritually with their children, bringing them up in the nurture and training of the Lord, showing them and teaching them your gracious word and their Savior, Jesus. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass, trespass against, against us. us. And, and lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the, power and the glory forever, forever and, and ever. ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. We close with him 213.
while time on earth is spent absent from him i roam yet nightly pitch my moving tent a day's march nearer home my father's house on high home of my soul how near at times to faith's foreseeing eye the golden gates appear lord be at my right hand then can i never fail if you uphold me i shall stand with you I shall prevail. So when my dying breath shall rend the veil in two, by death I shall escape from death to endless life with you. Once again, we invite everyone to join us in person at 9 a.m. on Sundays or 6.30 p.m. on Monday night. As the pandemic again continues to be conquered by God's grace, we know that now we are not required to wear masks in church anymore, but people are still welcome to, and we hope that you'll be able to join us in person. Again, a blessed Father's Day to all the fathers out there. God be with you until we meet again. <laughs>